Hello, you are watching uh, the press preview. It's our first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. And uh, tonight we'll be uh, discussing the headlines with former MP and broadcaster Anna Subri and Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface. They'll be with us uh, until just before midnight, speaking to them in a moment. But first of all, let's see what is on some of those uh, front pages. And we start with the Daily Mirror. He died serving the people. On to the Financial Times, it says the fatal stabbing of Sir David Amos has reignited the politicians' safety debate. Here's your Yorkshire Post writing about Joe Cox's sister, Kim Leadbeater, feeling horrified. Uh, Joe Cox, uh, of course, was the MP for Batley and Spen in Yorkshire before she was killed five years ago. Well, the Express writes about a terror probe into Sir David's murder. Uh, the Sun also leading on that story of a terror probe, also writing that Sir David Amos was a campaigner on animal welfare. Uh, the Times leads with the headline, Tory MP stabbed to death. Uh, it includes tributes to Sir David Amos. And tonight we are joined by Anna Subri and Susie Boniface. Uh, thank you both very much indeed for joining us on what has been the most awful of days, not only here in Essex, but uh, in Westminster and indeed uh, across the country. Um, Anna, perhaps we can start with you. Um, you knew Sir David, you both served uh, in the Commons together. Tell me about your memories of him. Well, I didn't know him uh, particularly well, but he was one of those great characters. Um, I think he was always a backbencher, and he did that willingly and through choice. And he served his constituents, as you know, because you're there. You've heard the, the huge and wonderful tributes that have been paid to him. But he had this um, really lovely... He wanted Southend, as, as your news reports have said, he wanted Southend to become a city. So at every opportunity, whatever the subject, he would always somehow slip in the fact that Southend should be a city. And then he might put in the rest of the question, what was something that was actually relevant to the topic that was being debated? But he did this beautifully, uh, and we always used to give him a huge cheer for that. So I think he was a fabulous example of a first-class constituency MP. And he was, also, he was also a very nice man, a very decent man, and a very happy man. Yeah, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, that famous sense of humour that he had. Uh, the Mirror sums it up very well, I think, Susie, doesn't it? Their headline, very simple, uh, he died serving the people, and that really was what he was all about, four decades almost, of serving the good people of this part of Essex. Yeah, and if you're not a, a Westminster watcher or a, a South End resident, David Amos and, and what he's achieved in those 40-odd years is probably, you know, something that hasn't crossed your radar until tonight. And we've, a lot of us have sadly learned more about him since he's died. But... There are an awful lot of people in the Houses of Parliament, MPs and their staff, who, like David, came from very poor, humble beginnings, who came through state uh, comprehensive and grammar school system, who hauled themselves up by their bootstraps and really have a, a sense of duty in public service. And there's a lot of that in all the parties on the back benches. And there are many, um, uh, well, it's used about the Tory party as grandees, I suppose, but the same applies to Labour and the Liberal Democrats and the other parties, the SNP and, and the Aust Unions and so on, who are kind of the old war horses of, of the political system of public life, who are there because they have a sense of duty. And uh, I was listening to an interview with David that he gave a little while ago to Ian Dale earlier on. And he said one of the things that really he really got his goat was when uh, a politician, uh, so, someone woke up one day and decided they were going to, you know, gift the Tory party, the, 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 the wonderful gift of their presence within it. And they were going to come along and I was going to say, 
And he didn't have much time for people who hadn't come up through the party system, who hadn't worked in local politics, who didn't care, who thought that they would, you know, they'd just go into national power and that would be it. He didn't have much time for those people, the Aravists. Um, but he's everyone, you know, I think when something like this happens, you can really judge people by um, the tributes that are paid to them because you can tell if it's just someone saying something nice because someone's died and they're not. Uh, David has brought out tributes from people on all sides which are honest and genuine and very, very heartfelt. And he seems to have been a, a decent and kind and very, um, how can I put it, very driven constituency MP, as Anna said, and lots of others have, but someone who for 40 years was chugging away quietly, sometimes not so quietly as well, you could be quite vocal, but um, doing very important work. How many MPs, how many male, white male, Tory backbench MPs do we see taking on endometriosis as a campaign? Not very so many. He was, he was unusual. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And at the yeah. same time, also one of those people that... that that you do get a lot of in Parliament, someone who cares enough about some some niche things like that. A constituent comes along, complains to him about something, goes, right, I'm going to take this on. Off they go. And Parliament needs more of that. And we're, we're one down now tonight. Yeah, well said. We spoke to uh, a priest today, also a head teacher, and both made the point that if they had an issue they needed uh, taking up in Westminster, they could ring him uh, and they knew that he would, uh, he would uh, uh, make good on that. Um, let's have a look at the front of the FT, uh, Anna. Fatal stabbing of Tory MP Amos reignites politicians' safety debate. And I know during your time as an MP, you suffered horrific uh, abuse and at times, I'm sure, were concerned about your safety. Um, when you heard this news at lunchtime today, um, what went through your mind? Oh, uh, it, it, it will have shocked everybody, uh, and rightly so, and it would bring into sharp focus the lives that MPs, the majority of them, live, which is that, you know, you want to be out and about, you want to be meeting your constituents, you don't not want to meet them. And, I mean, I used to do, and I'm not alone in this, and, and actually David, who we are right to pay tribute to, but... He's not unique. The work that he did, the way he operated as a member of parliament, is not unique. There's lots of MPs doing exactly that. And if you like, nationally, you don't hear about it, but locally, people know how hard their MP will work and have that access to them. But I mean, I, for, for, for example, um, I used to do a bit like David seemed to have been doing a sort of a drop in type surgery. And I used to do this thing called Meet the Team. And I'd have my councillors there, whatever their political parties were. And we'd, we'd advertise it, uh, dropping leaflets through people's letterboxes saying, look, we're doing this thing on a particular Saturday. Come along, everybody, welcome. Whatever your problem is, talk to us and we'll see if we can sort it out, blah, blah, blah. And you can bet your life that after Joe Cox was murdered, um, that stopped. I think I stopped that pretty much. I know I certainly stopped it because it was just... It was it was, it was it would have been reckless to have continued to do it. And I don't want to put my situation into David's. I mean, my what happened to me and, and mm. others but it was at a particular time. And I'm very happy to talk about MP safety, but I think that was a particularly dreadful time in British politics and it all got covered with Brexit. And so we didn't actually debate some of the things that we should have been debating, which was about the safety of MPs and which was also about the, the, the fact that it just seemed to be completely acceptable to uh, issue death threats to members of parliament, to slag us all off, to call us names. And if you like that, the whole tone and quality of debate absolutely went through the floor and right through into the gutter in our country. And I like, I'm going to want to believe that that's begun to change. But that doesn't mean to say that there isn't a real and genuine concern amongst MPs and particularly their families about the safety of that member of parliament. Yeah, and our, uh, our thoughts, of course, tonight with uh, Sir David's wife and his uh, five children. Uh, some of what you were saying actually reflected in, uh, in the Yorkshire Post, uh, their front page, uh, MPs killing is an uh, attack on democracy. They've spoken, like we have, uh, to Joe Cox's uh, sister. Um, and Susie, when it comes to democracy, when it comes to the importance of this cornerstone of democracy, if you like, this chance for people to meet their MPs, 
face to face. How do we keep that, um, but also maintain the safety of MPs? It, it's very difficult. Well, one of the things that Kim Leadbeater mentions in there is that her partner came home today and heard the news and said, I don't want you to to be doing this. I don't want you to be doing this job anymore. And I'm sure that there are um, MPs, partners and spouses and children and parents up and down the country who have had the same conversation with their <coughs> MP family member tonight um, as they would have done in 2016 when Joe died. And um, one thing I'd, I'd take some exception to and the thing that Anna said was that she was talking about what happened to her in the past tense. And I appreciate Anna's situation has kind of ended a bit in terms of what happened to her. But I'm sure when she comes on programmes like this, Anna will still be getting social media threats and unpleasantness. I get it sometimes when I come on to some extent, depending on what I say. Um, and we live, unfortunately, we seem to live in a time when the, the normal debate about whether we do things this way or that way, whether it's right or wrong, has stopped being logical and about yeah. decency yeah. or morality, and it started being emotional and it's tribal and it's do I do this because it's with my gut and it's not with my head. And so the debates that we have, they've gone. There's no longer any debate. There's just shouting on all sides. Uh, and it becomes very yeah. emotional, becomes very visceral, and then it becomes violent. And then you get people like Anna had, people following her down the road. You get people, I've had death threats in the last fortnight from people because I wrote about anti-vaxxers. Um, you know, it's, it's by no means anywhere near the same as what's happened to David today, of course. But we seem to live in a, in a situation, and I know Sky presenters get this as well, where people do feel it is all right yeah. to threaten to send absolute abuse women get a different kind of abuse to the men but men still get it too um and part of that problem i think is because of the algorithms that run our lives now you know it's not just on twitter and facebook mm. but on netflix as well if you watch one film one night they want you to watch the same kind of film the next night the next night the next night they keep suggesting things to you you've already liked once and it, if that happens with news and it happens with politics yeah. it happens with your films then before you know it you're down a rabbit hole where everything is exactly the same and we need to change that algorithm on social media just that one little tweak i think would improve yeah. things And it does seem, um, doesn't it, uh, so, sorry to interrupt, uh, Susie, uh, we're just coming up to the break, but Anna, I, I just wanted to make the point that it does seem, doesn't it, that um, uh, Sir David almost wasn't part of this sort of toxic nature of Westminster. He managed to, to rise above that, and, and, and as a result, he kept being voted back in. Yes, I, I, I don't... Look, I don't think there's that the, in the chamber of the House of Commons, certainly in my time towards the end, things got very, uh, quite unpleasant in there. But I do think, following on from what Susie says, something, there is something that needs to be said. Paula Sheriff, who used to be the MP for the neighbouring seat, Joe Cox's, made uh, an intervention on our Prime Minister during a very heated debate, and it was about Brexit. But she begged him to use language responsibly because, as she pointed behind her, to the, the shield that bears Joe Cox's name in, in memory of Joe and said, language is so important because you have to understand that real members of parliament are getting real death threats because of the, the language which we are using and this atmosphere of toxicity uh, and abuse. And it was dismissed by our prime minister as being humbug. And he got away with that. And nobody must now get away with that, especially not the leaders in our country. We have got to change, reset the dial on the way that we conduct ourselves and our politics. The language that we use is critical. And we call it out when it steps over that very clear mark into an unacceptable level of abuse. OK, all right. Uh, Anna, Susie, stay where you are for the moment, uh, if you would. Coming up after the break, more of uh, the front pages, including the terror probe into Sir David Amos's murder. That's on the front of The Sun. Taking a look at that and the rest of the day's headlines.
remember I was born eight years after independence and India was still trying to figure out who it was and trying to figure out the role of women in society. So I think as a society, it was very conservative as it relates to women, as it related to women. But in my family, the men in our family basically said, we want the women to dream, we want them to soar, do whatever they want. And my poor mother, who was bound by social norms, but still wanted her kids to soar, had one foot on the brake and one foot in the accelerator. And the combination of my grandfather, father, and my mother were three feet on the brake, I mean, on the accelerator and one foot on the brake. And that's why we were allowed to do whatever we did. I think that almost all of corporate America uh, you know, lacked diversity because there weren't enough diverse people who'd come in and risen in companies. Uh, they went out of their way to make me feel welcome, starting with the CEO and every executive. They were determined to make sure that I had the support I had the uh, developmental opportunities and the stretch assignments to thrive in PepsiCo. And I'm you know, very grateful to what they did because you know, when you're in such a senior position in a large company and you're so different, um, you know, it's tough to uh, assimilate, but they made it a point to make sure that they gave me a helping hand. Well, you know, uh, two things that happened. One is when I looked at the big mega trends that were going to impact the consumer industry and food and beverage companies in particular, I realized that there were multiple steps we had to take to future-proof the company. And one was the trend towards health and wellness. It was very important that we transform the company to meet the changing consumer and to change, uh, to meet the changing environmental requirements of businesses. But more importantly, a more immediate manifestation of that behavior was when a young kid came to a birthday party and she was dying to drink Pepsi. But she said, I've got to call and get permission from my mother to have Pepsi. That hit me because it said, not only is this trend something that's happening over the next decade, it's actually begun to accelerate now. And for me to make sure that our company stayed incredibly successful, I had to future-proof this company by transforming our portfolio into offering a range of products that were good for you, better for you, and fun for you. So therein started the big transformation of the portfolio. Cercando as áreas, limpando as áreas e progressivamente avançando com os plantios. Isso daqui é uma sentença de morte para os manguezais. Hello again, welcome back to part two of the press preview. Uh, Anna and Susie still with me. Uh, let's just uh, have a quick look at some of the other uh, front pages. The Sun, uh, MP murder terror probe uh, is there headline. Uh, also The Guardian, uh, Tory MP stabbed to death at constituency meeting. And the Saturday Times, uh, quite simply, saying uh, uh, Tory MP stabbed. Um, Anna, this is a um, very difficult day for uh, the Prime Minister as well, of course. We know that he was in Bristol with the Cabinet. They were having a, an away day, if you like. Uh, they were going to be talking uh, about green policy ahead of COP26. Uh, the Prime Minister then intending to head off to Chequers for the weekend. And then suddenly, in the most awful of fashions at lunchtime today, having to make a statement on something that no prime minister ever wants to have to do. No, absolutely, and um, it would have touched the live the hearts of every member of parliament. Um, and I noticed that um, that Priti Patel is having um, urgent discussions with uh, the Met, the other other police parts of the police force to discuss um, the safety of members of parliament. And I would imagine that on Monday, it, obviously people will be talking about this terrible tragedy um, and, and, and David's death. Um, 
but then they will be talking about the safety of members of parliament. And, and I think most members of parliament will want to continue to be able to meet their constituents, but how we resolve this, I simply don't know. Yeah, it's going to be a difficult day on Monday, isn't it, when MPs uh, return to the House, uh, not only uh, mourning Sir David Amos, but also uh, James Brokenshire, who uh, sadly died yes. uh, from cancer a short time ago. And Susie, um, uh, just a final thought uh, from you, an investigation obviously underway. Um, where do we go from here, do you think? Well, the suspect that's been arrested has been arrested under anti-terror legislation. That doesn't mean anything particular at this stage. But one of the things it does do is that it means that the police have 14 days to question him rather than four days, as they would do if it was being treated as a, a more normal murder, shall we say. So there's going to be an extensive investigation, which will obviously go into... Uh, <laughs> the suspect's home, any materials, his internet access, so on and so forth, which will try to establish what happened in the run-up to the events today. They're also looking at David A. Messi's um, constituency appointments in the surgery, whether this man was, was booked in or whether he just happened to be waiting there and how it all came about. They're obviously going to be speaking to witnesses as well. There doesn't appear to have been any slogan shouted or anything like that at the time of the death so far, as we know at the moment. So... That's what gets a seed. It's worth remembering as well, though, that when Joe Cox was murdered in 2016, the man responsible for that was also investigated in the initial stages by uh, local anti-terror police in West Yorkshire and that his case was handled under terrorism procedures. Susie, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt. We are out of time.